Thanks, Tam and team. Such a good time of worship. It's good to start that way. Um, if you weren't here last week, you would have missed out on the fact that we started a new series called Patterns, and we're going to continue with that series this week, and we're going to go all the way almost to the end of March with this series. So um, we're excited about it, really feel like God's laid on our hearts, and this is something in the beginning of the year we feel we want to be digging into, and it's on the heart of God for us as His people. And what Joe unpacked last week is prayer. Essentially, um, these things that we call the spiritual disciplines, and they're, they're tools that God has given us in order to pursue him and to, and to walk in righteousness and refine our characters into the likeness of Christ. And um, that's what we've been journeying in and that's what we're going to continue to journey for the next couple of weeks or months even. So this week we're continuing with that and uh, we're going to start in a bit of a weird place tonight because we are speaking about fasting and where we're going to start maybe seems a little bit disjointed and doesn't make sense but it will make sense just now so we're going to start in the book of 2 Timothy you don't have to turn there because it'll be quite quick it's going to come up here behind you but in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7 it says this right for the spirit of God gave us or the spirit that God gave us does not make us timid but gives us power love and self-discipline right then Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 27 I discipline my body and keep it under control now in their context those scriptures are speaking about the ability to exercise self-control from the spirit or through the spirit in resisting temptation and saying no to ungodliness and sin right but what they also highlight is the fact that the Christian life is a disciplined life it is a life of self-control and discipline. Not just discipline in saying no to the things of the enemy and saying no to wickedness and sinful behavior, but discipline in pursuing God. Discipline in pursuing righteousness and the things of the Lord. Discipline in training one's character into godliness. Right? The Christian life is a life of discipline. There's there's this analogy that I was given I thought it was brilliant and it sort of stuck with me all my life but someone said you know discipline is often so underrated but most things in our lives that are of any significance haven't been achieved without discipline uh, and the person said to me discipline people don't realize is like a bridge we we often have desire to achieve something if I think about you know, any sporting thing that I've wanted to achieve or anything of significance that you've wanted to achieve, it's, there's, this, there's been a desire that was birthed. It started with a desire to do something. And when you realize that, if you've ever got to the place where you, that's been actualized for you and you've lived it, if you look back, the bridge that you walked over is a bridge of discipline. Without discipline, any desire, almost any desire, can't really be achieved. Right? So, so discipline is important, not just outside of the church, but... I think even more so as Christians, as we walk with the Lord, discipline is necessary. But many people don't like the idea of discipline because it sounds hard and harsh. Right? And I think people have miscommunicated what it means to be disciplined before the Lord. It sounds quite militant. You think about discipline, you think about guys in brown suits, stock straight, marching in line. Right? Being shouted at by somebody to do stuff that maybe they don't want to do out on a tarmac or courtyard in the blazing sun it maybe sounds a little bit aggressive to people right there's grace grace and discipline there seems to be a bit of a disconnect with people when we realize that or are taught that the kingdom is a is a kingdom that belongs to the lord and we're in it and we're there by grace and there's and and there's and there's freedom and and, and so discipline doesn't seem to to match up there or maybe even it sounds a little bit legalistic right to be to be disciplined is a little bit legalistic but the reality is it's not but as as we read God's word and and we start to understand what he means by discipline it's, it's really just this it's training that is expected to produce a specific type of behavior or um, pattern in our lives and we know that the type of character we, God is calling us to is that of Christ Right? There's, there's this journey we, we're on. We're going from one degree of glory to the next. We, we are continuing, as Paul says, to work out our salvation with fear and trembling because it's God who works in us to willing to act to cause us 
to do according to his good pleasure, the things that he desires for us to do. There's this process we're on and we're being transformed into the likeness of Christ. That's the character that God wants us to take on. And the patterns that God wants us to establish are patterns of godliness and righteousness. Right? That's, that's what God wants for his people. That's why with such clarity and with such affirmation, Paul is able to say to Timothy, the person he was discipling and mentoring, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, he says, train yourself to be godly. And he says that to Timothy. He says, train yourself for, God, for godliness because physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things. There's a disconnect for me when we train ourselves so hard to be physically fit and we are rigid and strict with our diets. Right, and we go to gym early hours of the morning, late nights, right, and we discipline our bodies, but we don't apply that same discipline to pursuit of holiness and righteousness, godliness and Christ-like character in our lives. God calls the same thing from us. In fact, he goes, actually, it's better to be even more disciplined in the things of God and the pursuit of holiness. So discipline and godly patterns are good. The Lord expects this from us, Right? But God doesn't just expect things from us that he doesn't equip us to accomplish. He doesn't leave us hanging. He enables us to pursue him. He enables us to be godly and to be righteous. He gives us tools, so to speak, with which to be disciplined. And if we were disciplined with those things, it would develop our inner being and our spiritual maturity would skyrocket and our characters would be made more like Jesus. And those tools are often referred to as spiritual disciplines. You see, there's a scriptural principle, this biblical principle, and whether you like it or not, every single one of us is a farmer. Okay? I come from the Eastern Cape. There's a lot of farming that happens there. There is a lot here, but it's, it's different. Right? And, and so there's this culture and this lifestyle of farming. And many people maybe don't like the idea because you get your hands dirty, right? And the land smells like manure. And you've got to be up early in the morning and go to bed late at night. But every single one of us farms, right? Spiritually, it says this in Galatians chapter 6. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. The question is not whether you're sowing. The question is what seed are you sowing? Right? And you are sowing seed. You are a spiritual farmer. And the fruit of your seed will be later and it will be greater. Always. You don't plant a seed and then, unless it's Jack and the Beanstalk, right? Some fictional story. But in reality, you plant and the fruit is always later and greater. And God says, you are farming. There's seed that you can take hold of. And there's good seed and bad seed and you can plant it. Now, these patterns, these spiritual disciplines God gives us are tools with which to plant godly seeds. Seed that would take root, grow, bear fruit, and that fruit is a fruit of righteousness and godliness. So when we think about them like that, we realize that these patterns and these disciplines are actually more gifts than they are burdens. They're more of a blessing than they are a curse, Right? There are more things to be run after and taken hold of than there are to be avoided because they seem a little bit well, out of whack with grace and not done, but they don't really fit in with my paradigm of what it means to be free in the kingdom. They're more like opportunities to experience over and over again the presence of God and to, in a sense, brush up against His robe and be captivated with our God. That's what these things are. I don't know, but I've had moments, and the very best moments, when I've implemented these tools and I've been disciplined in these areas and developed regular patterns of using them. There have been moments where, in my pursuit of the Lord, my head has been lifted up, both physically and metaphorically, and your mouth drops open, and your heart is pounding in your chest because something about this thing that God has equipped me with that I'm doing has ushered in his presence in a way that I haven't felt before. Right? And it is refreshing and life-changing. These things are a joy. It is amazing. So 
just want to encourage you as we, as we begin to unpack these things week after week to remember that. These are not legalistic principles that have been set up and established so that you can impress God more or gain your salvation or gain a greater love from the Lord. These are things that God has given us to bless us and to draw us closer into His presence. And so last week, Joe looked at prayer. This week, we're looking at fasting. Right? Fasting is what we're going to be unpacking here. We're going to start off by asking these two questions right they're two fundamental questions that people ask when it comes to fasting one is fasting even biblical right is it even biblical or are we like complete heretics here right by suggesting this and two if it is biblical are we commanded by god to fast people often ask that question right and i get a sense that the reason why they're asking that question is because if god doesn't command me to fast then i'm going to leave that thing well alone Right, because my late night back noddle burgers are for me. Some guys are forced to fast because the engines closed down their burger shop. All right, it's like that's the tragedy and scandal of the century. Right, never mind that we're running out of water, but engine doesn't have the burger special anymore. So, so fasting is it biblical? I'd say to you, absolutely yes. Right, absolutely. You just you take a cursory glance of the scriptures and you'll see fasting somewhere. Right? In fact, fasting is mentioned more often in the Bible as something important as baptism. Right? Fasting is mentioned 77 times throughout the Bible. Whereas baptism, okay, it's just, it's just short, but like baptism is mentioned 74, 75 times. Right? The Bible often speaks about baptism. And on top of that, the Bible presents fasting as something good, something that is a blessing, something that's beneficial for the believer. And in Matthew 4, there's a record of Jesus himself fasting. We'll get to that a little bit later on, but, but Jesus himself fasts. And so the answer to that question is, yes, it's biblical. There's massive and huge biblical precedent for that, scriptural precedent for it. And it not only puts it um, often in front of us as we read scripture, but it puts it in a positive light. So there's no question that fasting is both biblical and good, right? That, that, that's a good thing. A lot of us fast, and it's good to know we're not doing something bad. Now, because of this, one would think that fasting, because it's so good, that there must be a command in Scripture for us to fast. And given the fact that Jesus was fasting and did fast, surely that makes it even more, you know, um, acceptable or obvious that there's a command that God's Word gives us to fast. But there isn't. There isn't a command in Scripture that demands us or commands us to fast. Right? Doesn't matter where you look and doesn't matter how hard you look, there is no command for you to fast. There's, there's no semantics that say, and you will fast and you must fast. Despite this, though, and because fasting has been such a blessing to people and they've experienced such spiritual growth and joy and intimacy with the Lord, they've tried to find a biblical commandment right, for fasting so that it can be forced on everyone, so, so that everyone can experience it and everyone can be urged. And if you don't fast, then you're told you're disobedient. Right? A lot of people, out of a good heart, want people to experience this, and so they look for a command, and they've made it a legalistic thing. And they've robbed people of the joy that actually comes with doing this thing out of a desire to willingly pursue God. Right? So where does that leave us? Why, why then preach on something and do a whole series on disciplines and bring up fasting if God's word doesn't command us to do it? Right? If it isn't even a command, why is it worth mentioning from the pulpit? Well, just because there isn't an explicit command in the scriptures to fast doesn't mean we shouldn't be fasting. Right? And just because Jesus never commanded us to fast doesn't mean that he didn't expect us to be fasting. But see, Jesus knows that if he commands us to do something, what happens when you're told not to touch something? You touch it, right? It's just how we are. If God commands us to do something, the sinful nature says no. And more often than not, it becomes this legalistic thing. So in my heart, I just feel like God's done me a favor by not commanding me to do something. And that doesn't mean I resist all his commands, but there's this 
precious thing about the disciplines, and I think and a command was avoided, but there's still a strong emphasis on the fact that God expects us to be doing this because it's a blessing for us. And two of the significant scriptures would highlight this fact are found in Matthew chapter 6 and Matthew chapter 9. Firstly, Matthew chapter 6. Jesus is in the middle of delivering the greatest sermon ever preached. It's known as the Sermon on the Mount. And in it, he gives a teaching on fasting. Right? And this is what he says. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their rewards. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, and your fasting may, so that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Now two things very significant about what Jesus teaches here. Right? His teaching on fasting here is in direct context with him teaching on giving and prayer. He teaches on giving to the poor and giving in such a way that your right hand doesn't see what your left hand is doing and giving out of the right motive of your heart. And then he goes into speaking about prayer and how you shouldn't pray on the top of your lung on the corner of the street like the hypocrites do and the Pharisees do and the men of the religious law do so that people can see them and, and think that they're great. Jesus says, don't do that. This is how you should pray. Pray in your closet. Pray in secret. And your Father who hears your prayers will reward them and answer them. Right? Then he goes straight into teaching about fasting. This is straight after that. It's, it, it's in that context. And so the assumption is that giving and praying and fasting are part of the devoted Christian lifestyle. We've got no more reason to exclude fasting from our lives than we do prayer and giving. Right? We've got no more reason to exclude it. The second thing is this. Jesus states twice in this passage, when you fast. But it's not a command. It's not couched in a semantic command. But Jesus does say, when you fast. He says this, when you fast, don't look gloomy. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face. See, Jesus is not destroying the idea of fasting. He's reforming it. He's going, people are fasting, but for the wrong reasons. When you fast, this is how you should fast. When you pray, this is how you should pray. When you give, this is how you should give. But somewhere along the line, prayer and giving have been elevated amongst or above fasting as if fasting is a sideline issue that we don't really have to get into. Then in Matthew chapter 9, there's another crucial statement Jesus makes about fasting. And it comes in response to a question asked by his disciples or asked by the disciples of John the Baptist. They're a little bit confused as to why they and the Pharisees are fasting, but the disciples of Jesus are not. Right? Listen to what their concerns are and then pay particular attention to the answer of Jesus. Right? Here's what it says. Then the disciples of John came to him saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them and then they will fast. Right? You, so this is probably one of the most important statements in all of the New Testament about fasting and whether Jesus expects us to be fasting. There is no way around this. You can't escape the forcefulness of his words and the clarity of his words. When I'm gone, my disciples will fast. They're not fasting now because I'm with them. Some people say that that time when Jesus was gone was the, the days between his, his death and his resurrection, those, those three days. But then that doesn't explain why people fast in Acts. It doesn't explain why there's record of people fasting over and over again for certain things. Way after the ascension of Jesus. We are living in that time where the bridegroom has been taken from us and he will come again to fetch his bride. We're in that time and Jesus says in that time they will fast. Right? As children of God, we should recognize and embrace the tools that God has given us to use to cultivate Christ-like character and godliness, to grow in spiritual maturity and intimacy with the Lord. And we should long to use these gifts and these disciplines to that end. 
If that becomes the pattern of our lives, and if we implement patterns in our lives, we use them, instead of asking, why would I want to fast, and why should I have to if I'm not commanded to fast, the question instead becomes, why would I not want to fast? Why would you not want to fast? Right? Because when you practice these disciplines, you realize that the joys and blessings of these disciplines far outweigh the challenges. So tonight we're going to look at some of the blessings and joys of fasting as well. But before we do that, I just want to cover two things. Two important things before we look at the joys and the blessings of fasting. But the first one is this. That the motive of our hearts when we fast is incredibly important. Right? The motive of our hearts is incredibly important. There's this common misconception that fasting will somehow impress God. Right, that he'll be so impressed by your fasting that he'll open the storehouses of heaven and give you anything and everything you want. In a sense, fasting is seen as this, this coin that we pop into the vending machine and then we push the button. Right? And if it doesn't come out, it'll get stuck. Kick the vending machine. Ugh. Right? God is not our vending machine and fasting is not a coin that we use to manipulate God with. The motives of our hearts are incredibly important when we fast. Richard Foster says this concerning this issue. To use good things to our own end is an absolute sign of false religion. God is not a vending machine. Fasting is not a coin. We don't use that to our own ends and for our own means. Fasting works on us, not on God. Fasting is not to manipulate God, fasting is to grow us into the likeness of Christ and godliness. Secondly, and tied to this point, when we fast, it should always be with a clear biblical motive. Right? We never just fast for the sake of fasting to tick some spiritual chore box. We never just fast for the sake of fasting. There always needs to be a clear biblical motive for the reason why we fast. Otherwise, when you fast, and you get hungry and you're hungry and you're hungry and your hunger acts like an alarm clock when that happens you're supposed to press in and be like oh yes I'm praying for this thing this is why I'm praying and then you press in and you pray and then you pray far more during the day when your tummy reminds you that you're hungry than you do when you're when you're eating normally right if there is no reason your fast is pointless because fasting in and of itself is not significant fasting is a means to an end and that end, God desires for it to be biblical and ultimately glorifying to him. So when we fast, there must be a biblical reason and our hearts need to be pure. And this, by the way, is what distinguishes Christian fasting from any other fasting than any other people, group, or religion does. Because Christians are not the only ones who fast. Right? We don't have the monopoly on fasting. Muslims fast Many other people fast. Atheists fast for, for physical benefits and, and health reasons. Lots of people fast, right? You go for a proper blood glucose or, or, or cholesterol test, they'll ask you to fast, right? There's many reasons why people fast. A Christian fast, the fast God calls us to, is one where we focus on Him and His purposes. And the ultimate goal of that fast is to achieve something that brings Him glory. Now, the blessings and joys of fasting. And I'm not going to list all of them. I'm just going to list a few. I'm just going to list some that are really significant for me. But firstly, fasting is a wonderful blessing in that it clears up our spiritual eyesight so we can see God with greater clarity. Often, we're so preoccupied with our lives and with this world and with the things that we want to get done and with the desires of the flesh, not always bad, but just the physical world and the physical realm. We're so, con so consumed with that because it's in our face and it's obvious. It's, it's more real to us than anything else at times that our view of God and his, and his glory is clouded. But what fasting does is it removes that fog by denying the flesh, by suppressing that. And Jason Humphrey said this once to me, it's almost like putting up your spiritual antenna, right? You get up onto the roof and you've got some bad signal in the spirit because you haven't been fasting, you haven't pressed into that, the flesh is dominated and so you've got this massive antenna or this massive digital satellite dish and you're receiving all the stuff from this world but somehow God seems to be fogged out he's communicating but we just don't see clearly enough and hear clearly enough because we're not pressing in so fasting really exposes the flesh and its weakness suppresses that and clears up our sight of God 
Often there are moments during a fast when God's presence is more real than it is when we're not fasting. And that's just because our ability to sense Him and hear Him is greater. His voice is heard more clearly. So much so that it becomes tastier to be with God, right, than it is to eat the food that we've been skimping on or losing out on. And then, then that scripture in Psalms that says, taste and see that the Lord is good, becomes more of a reality than a metaphor. But then you realize that to taste and see the Lord is good is a blessing. And no McDonald's burger or NGN special burger can outdo being in the presence of God. The second thing is fasting more than any other discipline or tool exposes the things that control us. Right? This may not sound like a blessing or a joy because we're secret private people. We don't want stuff to come out. But a true disciple of Christ thinks that this idea is wonderful because we want to get rid of the chaff and the nonsense and the stuff that's hidden. And we want to be made more like Jesus. That's our goal. That's our desire. We long to be transformed into his image. And fasting does this. Because so often we cover up what's inside. I know I do that. I sweep stuff under the carpet with food and other things. But with fasting, the cover's removed and the issues in our hearts are exposed. If there's pride there, it will surface. If there's anger there, it will surface. If there's bitterness there, it will surface. If there's jealousy there or strife, it will surface. If there's fear there, it will surface during fasting. And so often, tried to fast, and then I get angry. You know, hangry, right? Angry because you're hungry. And we justify it and we go, the only reason why you're angry is because your blood sugar low levels have dropped and you're in this place in this state. And you know, we justify it and we go, like, oh, yeah, let me just get some food because I don't want to be an angry person during the day. I want to fast and be a nice person. But then the reality hits home that actually the reason why you're angry is because you're carrying a stronghold or a, a spirit of anger in your life. And the enemy has this, we use the word topos, he has a stronghold, he has this, this place of authority in your life. You may have opened the door to him somehow, somewhere, and all of a sudden you realize actually he's got a little bit of who you are under his authority and there's this, this sense in which you are angry, it's just suppressed. And, and fasting brings that out. And that's something we need to celebrate. Because when things in the darkness are exposed to the light, we can bring them to the feet of Jesus and experience healing, restoration, forgiveness, and freedom. And God's people need to go, yes, amen. I don't want this thing to be sitting in my life the whole time. I want it to be exposed. And if fasting is going to get me there, then to heck with the burgers, let's get this done. Right? It needs to create this excitement in our hearts. It's not always easy. It's painful at times. It's not easy to admit I'm proud. It's not easy to admit I'm angry. It's not easy to admit I'm jealous or I'm fearful. But God's already paid the price for our shame and our embarrassment. I don't think there's anything that he wants to take away from us that is ultimately not for our good. Right? The third thing is this. Fasting reminds us that we are not only sustained by the physical food we eat, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Food does not sustain us, guys. Food gives life to our body, yes, and we can argue whether it does sustain us or not. If you're a dietitian or a doctor in this place, just hear where I'm, what I'm saying, right? While we're fasting, instead of feasting on the food which will leave us hungry again, we learn to feast on the Word of God. And that nourishes and enriches our soul. Right? You, you can't compare to that. Fasting puts you in that place where you realize, wow, there's something greater to be eating here, and it's the Word of God. Jesus says you do not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. The fourth thing is this, right? Fasting often results in increased anointing and power from God to accomplish His will. Increased anointing and power. Listen to what happened with Jesus after His fast in the wilderness, right? which is recorded in Luke chapter 4. I said we'd get to this. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by the devil. So I just want to get this quickly. Jesus is full of the Holy Spirit. The person of the Holy Spirit is in him. 
the Spirit leads him into the desert where he's tempted and tested and he fasts for 40 days. Right? And he ate nothing during those days, it says. And when they were ended, he was hungry. Understatement of note. And when the devil had ended, from verse 13, every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. And then listen to this. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. And a report about him went out through all of the surrounding country. Some, we just glance over this. right? Jesus is filled with the Spirit, the person of the Spirit. The Spirit leads him into the desert. After his fasting, he comes out in the power of the Spirit and starts his earthly ministry. There is a difference between the person of the Spirit and the power of the Spirit. You get a Holy Spirit person and Holy Spirit power. And this confuses people. When we pray to be filled with the Spirit again, what we're actually saying is we don't want the Spirit person to come back into us because God says that He's given that to us. This Holy Spirit doesn't leave us and come back and leave us and come back and leave us and come back. Right? Power leaves us. Power leaves us. Power left Jesus when the woman with the issue of blood touched the hem of his robe. He said he knew that he was touched by a woman of faith, by someone of faith, because power left him, not the Holy Spirit left him. And so there's this place where fasting somehow opens up the spiritual realm to us in a way that hasn't been opened up before, and God endows us with power for his glory. Right? So Jesus is filled with the person of the Spirit, and so are we. But fasting sometimes unlocks the power of the Spirit. There's Holy Spirit power. And it's through that power that the dead are raised, the lame walk, the blind see, the deaf hear, the mute speak. Chains fall off. People are led to Jesus. Because as we speak, there's power and people are enchanted and captivated with Jesus. You know, it's not going to come up as a point. I'm not going to unpack all of these. But fasting increases our effectiveness in intercessory prayer. Why? Because it increases our spiritual sensitivity and discernment. It increases our spiritual concentration. And it increases our ability to make godly decisions in our lives because our focus is on the voice of the Lord. Right? The point of this is this. Fasting is a tool, as a tool involves action in the physical, but the growth happens in the spiritual. Fasting with biblical motives to bring glory to God is about spiritual breakthrough and growth that will never happen any other way. It's a gift that God has given us. It's a blessing, and it should become part of the regular patterns of our lives. Right? It should be seen for what it is, a blessing. We want to end with this tonight. Most people go, Roland, I get this. I hear this, but I'm just scared because I've messed up so much. It's just so difficult. And that's because most of us are overachievers. And you read that scripture where Jesus says, and you'll do this and more than what I've done. And so you try to do a 41-day fast. Right? Or you try to do an absolute fast. No water, no food, and you end up like a prune in hospital on the drip. And you go, where was God in this? Right? When we make something legalistic and we get pedantic about the particulars, we end up in trouble. God is more concerned about your heart and the attempt to be obedient to Him than He is anything else. Right? And so there are certain ways that you can start with this and engage in this that gently and gingerly and tenderly leads you into a place where you can develop this as a robust pattern in your life. Right? One of those ways is by fasting one meal a day you don't have to start off with fasting 40 days just one meal just just skip breakfast and be god instead of eating breakfast this morning i am going to spend time in prayer with you and it doesn't matter whether i took 15 minutes to eat breakfast there's 15 minutes that i could have been in prayer with you and that's why this fast is going to be a good one fast lunch fast supper it doesn't matter start off with one meal Right? Or maybe only eat one meal if you're like really feeling brave. Start of that way. I'm going to fast two meals and just eat one. Right? So I'll eat, I'll eat my breakfast and then I'll fast lunch and supper. And in those times, be with the Lord. You can start off with something called the Daniel. I heard something really funny. Who's heard of the Daniel fast? Right? Who were the first beings to do the Daniel fast? And everyone's like, oh, it wasn't beings, it was one person, Daniel. I'm like, no, it was the lions. Right? On that day, they were having a Daniel fast. I thought that was funny. Anyway, 
You can, you can start off with the Daniel fast. If you don't know what that is, and also this, people get all really legalistic with this. Daniel essentially was offered meat that was on a, served on an altar to some wicked, weird gods. And King Nebuchadnezzar said that all his servants must eat it. And Daniel says to the guy looking after him, look, just don't give that to me. Give me fruits and vegetables and nuts and all that sort of stuff. And the guy was like, no, but then you'll get weak and sick and I'll get in trouble. And Daniel was like, let's just see, just do it for some time. And if I get weak, then give me the meat. But if I don't, and what ends up happening is Daniel ends up more strong, more healthy, better looking and all that stuff because he's not eating the meat, right? And so people have taken that and gone, cool, there's this thing called the Daniel fast. I'm going to fast like Daniel did. And I'm going to say, that's okay. If, if, if you can't cut out everything, then cut out meat products and dairy products. And if you think that's not going to be a challenge, try it. Because you're pressing into the things of the Spirit and the enemy's not happy with that, but there's victory that comes with that. So, so just try that, all right? Daniel did it for 21 days. Just do it for a week or a day. There's also something called a juice fast. You, you can try a juice fast. But that's not fasting from juice. It's just instead of um, just drinking water, try some juice. Have some apple juice. Have some orange juice. Right? That will give you energy for the day. You don't have to rob yourself of all food and drink water. Right? This is not about trying to be more holy than the next person and impress God. This is about positioning yourself in the spirit before the Lord. And if what you can do is drink juice today and skip food, do that. That's okay. And if you mess up, that's all right. Just start again. Now pick up from where you left off and ask God. Pray for the strength to do that and God will reward you. Right? And then you can do stuff, and this is the last thing I'm going to mention, like a sweets fast. Right? This is one of the most difficult things for me. Right? Give up sugar and snacks and um, tinkies, twinkies and things like that. Right? Give, up, give up those things for a while. Yeah. Give that up if that's a regular part of your day, if you find comfort in those things. Because sugar addiction is one of the major problems of our time. People are addicted to sugar, and it has the same effect on your neurological system as heroin does and pornography does. It's this massive issue, but it's swept under the carpet and seemed to be okay because it's a food source and a food stuff. Right? Just try fast sugar. Start off that way. Maybe you like to use a fast from all food would be better right? than just that. Just try that. It's okay. There's no legalism here. God wants us to be fasting, but there needs to be the sense of joy and excitement, even though it's going to be a challenge when we go into this, because we know ultimately it's for our good. Right? That's what I want to encourage you with, and that's what I want to leave you with. And I want to go into time where I, where I just pray for us and ask God just for this, this, this strength and this spiritual vitality and this desire to fast, and that it wouldn't become legalistic. It wouldn't become this heavy thing, but this freeing, joy, joyful thing. Right? I'm going to ask the team if you can come up. We're going to sing one more song together. <clears throat> as we close so if you're in that place and you're going wow god yeah this is really exciting I, I really feel you speaking to me and i want to commit even if it's once every two weeks i'm going to i'm going to fast right i want to encourage you although it says don't make it known to anybody maybe get a buddy with you a prayer partner and be like let's fast together let's hold each other accountable right you don't have to but maybe that would help you to start this thing you can you can start this pattern and and this discipline in your life. Do that. But if, if that is the desire of your heart, I want to I want to pray for you. And, and and you know whether this is something that God's been stirring up in your heart or not. I want to pray for freedom for you. I want to pray for a release from condemnation from maybe where you've not followed through with it in the past. I want to pray that God would energize you to be obedient to him in this thing. Because this pattern of fasting is a beautiful one which will bring freedom and release like you've never experienced before. So let's let's pray. Father, I just want to thank you for your word. God, I want to thank you that you call us to good things and you equip us in the Spirit with tools that will help us to experience those things, will help us to become Christ-like, help us to grow in maturity, and God, to ultimately bring you glory. And I pray for your people that's not in anybody who has this desire in their hearts to fast for the glory of your name and to become more spiritual in our makeup than we are physical. Lord, won't you give them won't you give them the strength and the willingness and the fuss bait through the Spirit to do that? And God, as they begin to see reward after reward and victory after victory, may it lift their eyes ever more towards you. May it encourage them ever more. May their faith increase. May they be, God, Lord, just anointed with power and authority to minister to people and to bring what you've given them to bring for the kingdom. May we be a community who fasts regularly for the glory of God. 
You are not condemned. You are not carrying guilt and shame and a sense of um, defeat, but who are victorious knowing that you're a God who sees our hearts and is impressed with the attitude of our hearts more than our actions. God, I pray for that. Release people from guilt and fear and shame where they've maybe not followed through. And I pray, God, that you would bring a renewed sense of rejuvenation in the Spirit and excitement in the Spirit and energy in the Spirit for the glory of the name of Jesus. Amen. Would you stand and join us? We just sing.